All right, welcome back to the Socality Show. My name is Scott. I'm your host with Socality, and we're so excited today. We are talking to James Broadband all the way from Auckland, New Zealand. Awesome. Right? Thanks, Scott. Yes, yes great. welcome here, James, an awesome creator and um, founder leading an innovative product that we're going to be talking more about. We're going to be talking about um, AI and all these um, amazing things that are happening for creators. Everything is changing in the landscape for creators. But James, we want to welcome you to the SoCali Show and get to know you. It's always exciting to get to know people across the earth. It is 2.30 for me on, on um, I think it's Tuesday, but you are Wednesday morning, nice and early, right? Yeah, we're living in the future here in New Zealand. You should come <laughs> check it, it out. Like? Is there anything we need to be aware of? <laughs> well, I was going to say, it's, it's going to be a bright day. Um, <laughs> the future is looking bright. Um, right. Yeah, there's a there's a lot to look forward to. You know, it's 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 just a twelve hour flight away. If you wanna, <laughs> it is. You wanna be I've only been to New Zealand once, and it was for like a day or two. You know, but it was beautiful. It was years ago, so and you yeah. come back and spend a long time there. Yeah, one hundred percent. You need mm -hmm. you need a few weeks. It's um yeah. If anyone's thinking about coming to visit, like come give yourself a couple of weeks. Come hang yeah. out here. Um, just hire an RV and just drive through the mountains. Is that that's um, the thing? Hey, just get an RV and just go. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I was thinking you were saying you're from Calgary, and it's it's really it's it's similar there, right? It's like mm -hmm. people love to come like um, travel up through like Banff and and yeah. Have you been back there? I actually lived in um, in Banff for Did you? Okay, for six so months. We're getting to know you. Okay, so you were here for six months. <laughs> Yeah, I was like a little eighteen-year-old grom, like uh, just chasing the snow. Actually, of course. Um, Banff. I not that you're Aussie, but all of Banff is Aussie. Is Aussie. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. If you want to experience like Australia, the second you just go to Banff, it's like literally every single server person in the hospital. And I get it. They all want to come here and do the snow. It's just like every. I was recently, not recently, a couple of years ago, I went to Byron Bay, and all the servers were Canadian, and it was like I felt like I was in a flip universe. I'm like. This is weird. You know, it's like Byron Bay is like where the Canadians go or surface paradise. And then it's like, it was just kind of one of those things says, yeah, I guess it would be because all the Canadians want to go surf and all the Aussies want to come <laughs> snowboard. Ski. Yeah. 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 Exactly. What did it's... you do in Banff? What, where did you work? Well, I was 18 years old. Um, <laughs> so it was a little while ago. Yeah. Um, How, old I worked at... How old are you now? Uh, 34. Okay. Uh, so, uh, it was a while ago. I worked in a hotel called Inns of Banff. If you're yeah, a, I know. Do you know they're just getting a major, major makeover? Oh, good to know because that place yeah. was a piece of <laughs> shit. You've you been lying <laughs> uh, up at night thinking, "How is the Inns of Banff doing?" Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's currently yeah. being like literally tore down and rebuilt. Like it's going to be insane. So oh, amazing, cool. You'll it's, have to come back for a, 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 <laughs> you know, and just do a little stay just for the fun of it. Yeah, yeah, I'd love that. So six months, you did six months. You didn't do the year. Uh, nah. Well, I, I ended up working at a summer camp afterwards for a few months, which is loads of fun. Um, nice. Yeah. Now, honestly, it was just, it was a really great time. I wasn't one of those sort of like Kiwis Aussies that came over and hung out with a bunch of other Aussies. I, I lived with, it's a funny story, but I lived in a one bedroom house with six dudes and um our rent was a hundred dollars a month each <laughs> in bam <laughs> yeah this was well, definitely we were, a long time ago we were all sharing um we were sharing one room so it was wow. yeah it was a lot of fun it was like uh i'd kind of like have to save my tips from one day so that i could pay uh, rent for the month and then I was always right. saying to my boss like less shifts give me less work and he's like yeah. we really need you and I was like no 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 Let, I just give me two shifts a week that's like yeah. the perfect amount um, yeah no it Banff has changed a lot so you would have to come back and experience it but it is similar to New Zealand in the sense that beautiful mountains and uh, amazing landscapes and so I definitely want to come over and spend some time doing the whole um journey thing how often do you get out because uh, i know you're quite far from that landscape aren't you how far does it take you to get to those Queenstown, spots down for example is like a one hour flight from Auckland. oh okay okay um, but if you're going to drive it would it would you'd have to do it over two days there's really? ferry in between the two islands wow um, okay but i'd say i'm down in queenstown frequently a lot of the photo shoots that i would do are down there and so um a lot of the couples i would shoot with flying from overseas they want to mm. go shoot in a, in a beautiful location in the mountains and so so i'll meet them down there when did you start your photography journey like what was your 34 now what was that like for you how did you get into it um talk to us a little bit about that yeah yeah 
My journey into photography is um, is a little uh, unique, and so I'm always a little hesitant to tell it, especially, you know, we used to run loads of workshops and stuff like that, and I would tell this story, and, and people would be like, oh my gosh, like, I'm not going to have that story. Could I actually become a photographer? <laughs> and pretty much as as it went was i i loved photography i've i've always loved photography i have photos of me when i was like 12 years old holding um you know a little disposable camera in the mirror my parents used to buy um film for me so i could just like shoot and practice and it was really in my early 20s that that love <clears throat> started to grow into like a bit of a passion and it was mm. in parallel with with travel I might just clear my throat and see if we yeah, can start that again. Yeah, and it was really in my 20s where that love for photography really started to grow into a passion. And I found myself, you know, doing it more and more. It was what I wanted to spend all my time doing. And I, like many people, had a friend who was a wedding photographer, which was kind of my in to that industry. And I was looking at him and I was like, wow, he has a really interesting life. He has to work like... 20 hour, 20 days a year where there's sort of like a commitment where he needs to be. And each of those days, you know, you make quite a lot of money and with it comes a lot of freedom. And that was what really attracted me to wedding photography as an industry. And I always knew that beyond wedding photography, I wanted to start another business. I'd always been running some kind of business as, as a child. It was like, I don't know, I was like 10 years old and I found a way to sell Christmas trees. And I was like, my dad's work was changing out their computers, the CD ROMs for DVD ROMs. And I sold like a hundred DVD ROMs. Like it, just as a child, I was finding these ways to, to make money. And, and then as I sort of grew older and older, that, 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 that was just something I realized I, I loved to do, which was just to solve problems. Mm. And wedding photography was really obvious direction to pursue because of the freedom that it had and it was pretty clear to me that you know as a as a wedding photographer the sort of like the crux of your income is mo made over the summer period and you spend the rest of the year you know working on your brand working on your business um all that kind of stuff but you know with that i was like oh i could like run something on the side so from the outset, that was kind of the, the goal and the focus. And I must be getting a little bit sick, which is yeah. going to be a bit <laughs> annoying. Yeah. So I decided I, was, I wanted to be a, a wedding photographer. I started. Um, so this is like when you're 20 or around that age. Yeah. Yeah. A uh, little, little bit later, sort of like okay. 20. Well, let's say like 24. I, I really the, the beginning of my journey is really of taking photography seriously was I did this trip where I traveled overland from India to Europe. And I, for some reason I decided that that was a great idea and that's what I wanted to do. And if you think about that, it's, you kind of have to travel through some pretty um, gnarly places. I traveled through Pakistan, Iran, Iraq, wow. through Turkey. Were you uh, capturing to, this? You were capturing all this? Yeah. And, it, and th this is what I say to people when they want to get into photography is sort of like one of the most important things to do is just to shoot every day as often as you can as much as you can you know they they talk about the ten thousand hour rule where mm -hmm. you know shoot for ten thousand hours or do, do what you do anything for ten ten thousand hours and you'll sort of become an expert in it and that's exactly what i was doing every day i was shooting my environment every day i was returning to my computer at the end of the at the end of the process and editing Back then I had a Tumblr and I was like documenting the whole process on there. I wish I'd done it on Instagram. I thought that Tumblr was going to be the future, but it turned out that it was Instagram. Um, and so I grew like this following on Tumblr, which is absolutely useless now. <laughs> and people obviously were really interested in what I was doing. And I, and I started to like, just put the word out there a little bit and say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to shoot wedding photography. So the journey into that was like, find some mates who were willing to get into wedding dresses and just shoot them, uh, which was, was sort of fun and funny for them. And, and then I started publishing those photos and I got my first booking. Wow. I got my, got my first booking. It was like a friend of a friend and they were like, you know, how much do you charge? And someone had, had said to me, if you want to get into wedding photography, you can really get stuck in this lower kind of category in terms of your price range and a lot of your early bookings will come through referrals and so they'll sort of expect you to be cheap because your friend was cheap and so they were like you know how much do you charge and i was just like i charge two thousand um, dollars and so my first booking was 
at the time, I would say, a reasonable price point, and I was able to just sort of layer on top of that. So I shot that. Um, I just returned from this trip traveling uh, full time. I didn't have a job. I didn't have, I just moved into my parents' house and I was like, I'm going to just go full time into photography. So the day I shot my first wedding was the day that I became a full time wedding photographer. Wow. Uh, within the next six months, I'd booked six more clients and they were all within that six month period. And I remember the wedding I shot. So the first one was January, the wedding I'd shot in June that year, it was published in this magazine here in New Zealand called Magnolia Rouge. And it was like a really, it was a pivotal point for my career. Uh, there were some really amazing things about this shoot, like these wild horses turned up. It was a winter wedding, but it was beautiful. And so we did the whole photo shoot through the middle of sunset. Wow. And the bride and the groom, they just looked amazing. They were, they, right. they were, they were just smiling the whole day. And from that June to the following June, I shot 30 weddings, which is way more than you should, <laughs> especially when you're starting out. Yeah. I, the ideal number is probably like 20 or something like that. And it, I was still like working out how to run a business. Right. So things and, just took off for you so quickly. Yeah. And that's why I say like, I'm always hesitant to share it to people who haven't got into wedding photography yet because it's, it's an it's an abnormal abnormal journey into the process of of shooting weddings and at the time um facebook ads had kind of just launched mm -hmm. and everyone was really into updating their facebook status to engaged when they got engaged right and i worked out that i could get an engaged woman onto my website from my city f for like two dollars or something wow. absurd so it and, would read when someone was engaged and feed your ad to them. Yeah, exactly. Wow, I did not know that. I mean, uh, yeah, and, and you, you, you can still run those ads, but I don't right. think anyone really updates their Facebook status anymore when, <laughs> when they get engaged. <laughs> and so yeah, okay. it was kind of like the sweet spot. And yeah. at the same time, a good friend of mine was getting into wedding photography. And, and we started sh shooting together during that summer, and we just loved it so much. We were like, hey let's build a brand together. Um, all the parts of photography, which we don't love so much, which is like running the social media, building the brand, managing the emails, all that kind of stuff. We can share that. And we, we kind of brought different qualities to it. Mm -hmm. He's really great in like visual design and branding. Um, and we just sort of like taught each other everything we knew about photography. And it was, it was a really fun journey, sort of like, it was one of my closest mates. We built this brand together. It's called Chase Wild. Yeah, and it took us all over the world. We shot weddings in uh, over 13 different countries. Wow. I was flown into like mainland China to shoot with people. I think some of my highlight weddings were um, this amazing four day wedding I shot in India and we shot on the backs of camels in the desert. Oh, wow. Um, that is nuts. Morocco shot an amazing wedding How there. How people finding you? Well, that was the thing. We kind of, we built a brand which was internationally recognized. We were published in, you know, kind of all the main wedding blogs. There's this like wedding magazine based out of here in, in New Zealand called the T Together Journal. And we were, for one year, we were published in every single issue of it. Wow. And so we were really good. Because I think because there were two of us behind the brand, we, we, we were able to spend a lot of time. Were you like, doing this intentionally? Like, or was it happening organically? Like how... How intentional were you at getting this kind of coverage? Oh, very, very intentional. Okay. Um, and we'd do a lot to, yeah, just to make sure that th the images were getting in the hands of everyone involved. Mm -hmm. um, we would submit almost every wedding into blogs. We were really big on curation and, um, you know, finding the perfect set of images that could tell that story perfectly. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so it kind of, it's it steamrolled from there and it was a really exciting time. I used to, I think there was one year where I, I had 200 flights. Um, wow. Right? Maybe I'm misquoting myself. <laughs> I mean, go for it. I say 200. No, no, no. That's right. Um, uh, and is it all outside of New Zealand? Like you're going in and out of countries. Where's the furthest place you travel? Wow. I mean, like. In Zabam? Did you come back? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I shot. I I did shoot a wedding um, <laughs> in Canada, not in Banff, but sort of um, south of Toronto. Oh yeah. Um, we worked quite a lot on our SEO, and I don't think photographers are really focusing much on SEO at the moment either. 
we managed to somehow get to number one for Faroe Island wedding photographer. And so wow. we flew into the Faroe Islands loads of times. Cause how long is that trip for you guys? Three flights. Right. <laughs> That's how you add up to like 200 so quickly. It's like, yeah, you want to go to Faroe big, Islands and back. There's yeah. six flights basically. Yeah. But um, yeah, my mum my mom actually lives in London. And so I would fly up to London mm-hmm. kind of like for our winter, the European mm-hmm. summer and just base myself out of there. And, mm-hmm. you know, it was much easier for people to, to fly you around. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. I, I, I really don't recommend it. It's uh, <laughs> as, as, I, unless you're maybe like, yeah, young and single and have zero mm-hmm. responsibilities. It's right. not a great life you're away from your friends all the time um it's exhausting you you spend i mean for each booking especially if you're flying out you're you spend more time traveling than you do actually on the shoot and so at the end of the day if like we were trying to maximize the amount of income we were making we would have just shot every single booking here in Auckland. right of course um, you can wake up in your own bed and go to sleep in your own bed which is really nice but yeah it was was it was it worth it doing it like obviously it's worth it in the sense that you get to see things but do you think it's the same kind of um revenue um shooting locally as it is to destination wedding or is it actually more beneficial depends what your approach is i think when we were first getting into it we would sort of we would lower our prices in some cases just to kind of like get the person over the line it's like a flight from new zealand to europe is a lot of money or we would get them to pay for half of it and kind of just count on booking a few more while we're up there. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, once you break into this like upper echelon of high end weddings, there are people out there who want to spend $20,000 or more on a wedding photographer. And your only option is to fly in for these weddings because, you know, in New Zealand, there's only a couple of weddings a year where they spend, you know, 200, $300,000, $400,000 Three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars on the wedding, right. so then it kind of becomes a necessity, mm. and um, yeah. So, but you've kind of got to get to that that point first, and then right, and it kind of. So you're having there. all that that uh, you know traction, and then w- where are things changing for you now? Like you obviously, Chase Wild. Is it how many weddings are you still shooting weddings? Is that still happening? Like, what does that look for, like for you now? Yeah. So we haven't touched on this yet, but yeah. I own a software company called Narrative. We yeah. uh, have two products in market. Our flagship product, Select, uses AI to assist a photographer in the process of selecting their images. And so nowadays I juggle being the CEO of Narrative and keeping my finger on the pulse in terms of shooting. And yeah, it's really important to me just to just to be in the game i mm. try and shoot about five shoots a year just to be relevant right. to yeah just to be over what's just, what's happening to use the product yeah and so let's talk about that let's talk about narrative because obviously as you're telling your backstory i'm kind of seeing in my mind how narrative came to be <laughs> is a problem solving tool for you who's obviously shooting weddings so tell me where the concept for narrative came up for and then let our our audience know what is narrative and yeah, just the beginning origin story of Mm. it for you and like what year and the thought process and that whole journey to becoming a CEO of a company that is now solving problems for photographers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, narrative was born out of the problems that I was experiencing as a photographer. I, it frustrated me that for every day that I spent behind the camera, I'd have to spend four behind the computer. And even more so when it's like, you don't have a lot of time to spend four days behind the computer. The the major problem as a photographer is that you get paid for the time that you're with the client. You don't get paid for the time that you're doing your post workflow. And that was a real like pain point for me. Cause I was like, if I could, yeah, the limitation was just how many hours I had in the day. So I was seeing all these problems left, right and center. And I was like, someone needs to solve these. Someone needs to make this process faster. Um, the first product that we built was called publish. It solves this problem of building long form photo blog posts. So if you want to create a blog with more than 20 photos in Squarespace, Wix or WordPress, it's a massive headache. It's really annoying. It takes ages. Um, building the layout is horrible. Maybe it, yeah. And there have been some improvements, but photographers don't know how to do SEO um, and they would kind of do the whole process wrong. And this is integral to 
how we'd built our business. And I would spend over a day building a blog post. And I was like, I know that this can be done better, faster. Mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, sort of the origin stories of that was I, I actually reached out to a whole bunch of uh, software companies that were working in the f photography industry. And I said, these are the problems that we experience. This is universal. It's not just me. Um, you should build products in these space. Mm. And they all emailed me back and they were like, yeah, that makes sense. The only problem is we're, we're a bit busy right now. And <laughs> um, I'm not sure, you know, if or when we'd, we'd have the time to get onto that. And that was kind of like a light bulb moment for me. I was like, oh, they're not all sitting around going like, what problem do I solve? They're sitting around trying to focus on the, their existing problems. So if anyone's going to build this, it probably needs to be me. Mm. And yeah, I sort of bootstrapped it myself initially, hired an engineer to start working on publish. Really? And um, he spent sort of like six months and then building the first version of that. And yeah, it, I guess by this time I'd, um, amassed, a you know, not massive following, but just a following of, of wedding photographers. And so when I launched that product, everyone was really interested in it. You know, week one, we had 500 signups, which was a really good sign. And it sort of just steamrolled from there. And very quickly I knew, okay, we know how to build products for this market mm -hmm. and we should sort of open our eyes a little bit broader because publishers, you know, loved by thousands of wedding photographers, but we were like, what, what is it that we should build for all photographers? Mm -hmm. And it was pretty clear to me that the space of image selection is this deep need. I would spend anywhere between five to eight hours doing selection from a photo shoot and it's painful, it's mm -hmm. laborious, it's repetitive, mm -hmm. um, it's boring. And, and most of the time you're just trying to find like, you know, that perfect image from each scene. Lightroom is a dog. You won't hear a photographer who has a good relationship with that product. It's mm -hmm. slow. And so from the outset, we were like, cool, let's, let's build a product in this space. It's, there's a really big need here. Yep. And like most startups, it usually originates around this intersection of a problem and a new technology. Mm -hmm. And AI was becoming cheaper to build and it sort of became the cornerstone of this product, which is we leverage AI machine learning to give photographer insight into the images from their shoot to enable them to find the best images. Right. And without seeing the products, it's kind of hard to conceptualize because people go, oh, so do you just like, you know, find, show them the best images? Absolutely not. Because there's such a creative process in the process of capturing your images and finding those good photos. Right. And in so many occasions, sort of the criteria of what makes an image good gets broken down, you know, like the rules of what makes a photo desirable are not always true. There's many occasions where someone spinning around in a circle blurry out of focus is an amazing photo mm -hmm. where, you know, subjects with their eyes closed are acceptable, where, you know, people cracking up with maybe not great expressions is actually a really important photo because that photo might have meaning to the person inside that. Mm -hmm. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we create a product which enables the photographer to, to run this process faster, but doesn't take that creative control from them. Right. And it's, it's, it's a hard challenge. Um, so, you know, first of all, we, we evaluate the images within a photo shoot, there's like 10 different attributes, which we understand some of them, including the obvious things like the state of a person's eyes, their facial expression, their head direction, the importance of the person inside the photo, the context of the photo, um, what they're doing in that image. And then we break that photo shoot up into what we call scenes, which are groups of images with like a single desired output. So when you hear a photographer shooting, their shutter's like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. Mm -hmm. and you have like a group of photos, they're pretty similar. Generally speaking, you like, you might want one or a couple photos from that scene. And with this knowledge, we're able to make suggestions and give um, insight into those images. So from the most simple level, I would say low level of automation, we give 
will indicators below people's face which show you the status of their eye and the focus of that face so it might say like a red indicator would mean that they're blinking or they have their eyes closed and then there's like a a scale which shows you how in focus that face is because just zooming in and out is really annoying sort of continued on this level of low automation that we offer there's a close-ups panel on the right hand side and it gives like a full crop of every single face in the image which makes it really easy to you know especially when people are quite far away make a quick judgment about you know if this is a good shot or not and then layered on top of this we start to make these smart judgments about the image images in your in your photo shoot and and offer you a little bit of insight about that so i talked about those scenes which are groups of images um with a you know a single desired output we we created this new ui which enables you to view a photo shoot scene by scene and you use right and left to move between scenes and up and down to move between photos so when you find a photo and a scene that you like you move to that next scene and we reorder that scene from its chronological order to what we believe to be most desirable to what we believe to be the least desirable at the bottom. So you're looking at what is probably the best photo and you can make a judgment at that point. Oh yeah, this is what I wanted. You know, right. it might be something real basic. Maybe it's just a family photo and like the AI is going to nail that every time. Mm -hmm. Smiling, eyes open, looking at the camera, great expressions, da da da. You can select that photo, use your right arrow, you, and you're just directly onto the next scene. So you don't have to look at those next eight images. Right. And then you you might arrive on a scene, and like I said, it's like um, you were sort of like breaking the the rules of creativity. You were trying something new. You you had a lot of movement. You had something where it was like yeah, something where you're like I don't know the rules of what makes something an image desirable might not be true here. Right. And you have that freedom and control to dig a little deeper into that scene and move through the images within that scene and choose like, oh, actually, I might, I might um, see what else is in here. Right. And this is kind of how we've, um, yeah, enabled photographers to save a whole lot of time in that selection pro process. Photographers say that, you know, what would take them six to eight hours now takes them two hours because okay. they can look at significantly less photos but still remain in full creative control right. in terms of their output does it only work with like photos when there's people in it does it work with landscapes like how does it work when it's just landscapes yeah it's select is built for photographers of people right. um photographers of people the kind of the, the rules which make an image desirable are much more they're not objective, but they're more objective than landscape photography. Right. So it's more agreeable in terms of what a good expression would right. be than um, a good composition of a landscape or something like that. So, um, and photographers are people the ones who go out and shoot three to 5,000 images on a photo shoot. So yeah, yeah. if you're yeah. a photographer of people, um, this product is built for you. Yeah. So you came up with this concept in what year did you? We first, well, we actually first launched Select two years ago, so 2021. Um, okay. We launched Publish in 20 and kind of were in the cave working on that as far back as 2017. Yeah. Wow. So you've seen great growth. What is, um, it, before I get to this question, so just for people listening, I mean, they're going to go check out Narrative. Um, but how does it work? Like, where am I uploading my photos? What's calling it? Like, what, what does this software yeah. look like? Yeah, great question. So Select is a desktop application. Very importantly, Select doesn't upload your photos. They remain on your computer. And this is kind of one of the big challenges for us is that we built AI which works locally on your computer. It doesn't sort of like take your images away. Mm. Um, into a server where you kind of have no idea uh, what's happening with them. So it's it's really simple. It's a desktop application. You load the images and it processes them. And then there's this big button in the top right hand corner when you found the images you want. It says ship and you hit ship and you tell it where you're going to edit those photos. Right. Lightroom, Capture One, wherever. And then it will take those photos onto your, um, nice. onto your editing software. Okay. Okay. That makes complete sense. And so now talk to us about, about how you've scaled this business. So you've started, you've solved the problem, basically solving your own problem, which I think any great 
founder or creator, that's that's where they birth something out of is a, a need within themselves. Um, so you're doing this. You said you had 500 signups right away. Is that for narrative? Is that? Yeah. So that was with um, that was with publish. Publish today. Tens of thousands of photographers use our products. Right. And uh, so what are your what are you doing to market it, scale it, grow it, and what have been some challenges along the way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean. I think one of the amazing things about building a product which is so deeply in need is that you experience this natural organic growth mm. and how users are just obsessed with the product and they like shout from the rooftop about it. So if you look at our Instagram on any given day, there's yeah. someone who's like, I just found the most amazing tool. Right. And so a big part of it is really just being working out how to harness that right. natural organic growth, which oh. is happening. How do you enable your users, um, your power users, your influential photographers, your educators to kind of, you know, be the champions of the product? Yeah, and that's simply, that's what you do. You make them the hero and mm -hmm. then they're, you know, th through the product and they'll talk about it. Um, and that's been what's most effective and imp impactful for us is, I think especially as, you know, a startup, you don't have a lot of cash to mm -hmm. throw around. We don't have a huge marketing team. We don't have huge marketing budgets. Right. And uh, our growth has been, yeah, it's been really strong. So select processes about a billion images a year from photographers worldwide, wow. which is kind of hard to grapple <laughs> your head around. <laughs> it's yeah, huge. And a large amount. So mm. it sounds to me like you, you know, obviously when you were doing wedding photography, you still are, uh, but you really dialed into that Facebook advertising. You were mm. able to focus on that. Did you use some of those strategies to reach a new audience? Like what were some of your marketing tips? Did you just rely on word of mouth or were you doing social ads? Like how are you getting the word out there about narrative? Mm. The thing that's kind of interesting about building a brand like narrative is that trust is so important and that brand awareness piece is quite tricky. And so we spent heaps of cash on Facebook ads early on, and we were basically just throwing money in the toilet. Mm -hmm. It was like the cost per sign up in some cases, while well, the cost per converted user was upwards of like 500 bucks, it wasn't working for us. And so wow. we, we pulled back on that majorly. Mm -hmm. And I think that starts to make more sense, um, as you establish yourself in the market, as people, you know, just start to build trust with you. They, you know, what they say, it's like a person needs to see a brand like three times until they'll they start yeah. thinking totally. about maybe mm -hmm. signing up for it. Yep. And this is why leaning on our existing users, affiliates and educators was so powerful because they kind of double barrel solve that problem where if you hear a friend who's using something, it kind of solves trust issue. You're like, oh, Scott's using narrative and he loves it. Uh, right. It must be, you know, because you see an ad on Facebook and you're like, what is this thing? Like, exactly. I don't, I don't, you don't know don't about care. it. You don't have a personal connection to it. Yeah. And is it actually going to do what it says it does? Or right. is it just going to waste my time? Because the number mm -hmm. of times I've downloaded a product thinking it's going to do something and then it doesn't. I'm just like, oh, right. And then you read the review. The point? Like, oh, yeah. 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 So I think that's really important for, for anyone else launching a company or a product in a space which really requires trust is how do you make your earliest users your champions mm. and how do you get them to um, drive distribution for you and it's things like your referral program and your affiliate program and all of that kind of stuff which sort of enables you to to get things moving and then as as you start to mature more and you're at that scale up stage you start to approach it more differently you've got bigger funds um, you start spending heaps of cash on brand awareness and that kind of right. stuff. And, and sort of that marketing strategy and approach changes a little bit. Because now you're at 20, you said 20 staff. So you've really scaled. And yeah. what, what are some of those challenges that um, people always think that, oh, getting more staff helps? Do you find that just new challenges along the way? What, is, what have some of those challenges been since you've grown as a team, grown as a business? Oh, I mean... Uh, we should start with my challenges. <laughs> <laughs> sure, yeah, I think that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, uh, prior to starting Narrative, I had never worked for anyone and I had never worked in a company before. And that's quite right. significant. Like I was a sole trader my whole life and we started hiring people who, 
you know, super experienced marketers, product managers out of like companies like Google, Zero, Uber. Um, oh, just uh, a few small companies. <laughs> yeah. And these guys all had expectations on right. what companies should be like and how right. it should operate and what, how well defined the strategy should be and what leadership should look like. And that's a real big challenge. And I had to sort of like level up my skills really quickly. And, you know, I sort of gathered a whole lot of, well, a few mentors around me who were able to assist me in that process and sort of just spent every spare moment I had trying to level up myself. Right. So you're starting, literally starting with you. Like, how do I grow as a leader, as a founder, as a director, as a boss, as a visionary? and using those people around you to elevate yourself. Did you find that really challenging? Because you were like, like, how did you deal with that internally? Were you, did you ever take criticism negatively or were you just like, ah, oh, no, this is great. I take on all the criticism in the world. Like, what was that process like for you? Mm. I love feedback. I'm, I will always ask feedback from my team through, throughout any process. And I think it's really important. Um, but yeah, it's, I think the hardest challenges are when you've got a problem that conflicts with someone's ego and how do you, how do you solve that? Like people are very emotionally connected to their ideas and their thoughts. And so how do you build a culture where that doesn't exist? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and that's kind of one of the things that's interesting about building a business is that you're not just building a brand and solving a problem, but you're kind of, you're creating a team mm -hmm. and that team creation piece is so much more than just hiring the right people. It's like the culture you create, the environment that you have. Um, and, and people want to exist inside a company where they feel valued, where they're on like, um, a pathway of career progression where they can see where this kind of, I want them to see narrative as the stepping stone mm -hmm. to the next big thing that they want to do. And that's mm -hmm. important. Not that narrative won't be that like in many cases, it might be, but I want them to have really big ambitions in terms of what they're trying to achieve and where they're trying to go. And that's kind of what drives a person to, to do their best work. Mm -hmm. What are, yeah. And going to that, what are some of the, pra like I hear you say, you like feedback, you like all this stuff, you've got these challenges. What are some of your practices as a creator, as a founder that help, help you grow to be the best leader you can be like, are you reading? Like, what are you, mm -hmm. what do you, what do the practices look like in your daily life to help you get there? Yeah. One resource, which was a lot of help for me actually is, um, this podcast called 20 VC, which is, um, it's actually run by a VC. It's called 20 VC. Cause he had this idea that he just wanted to make 20 minute podcasts okay. and he cool. interviews some of the best founders in the world. And in terms of, you know, problems they are facing, um, challenges they overcome. Yeah. Leadership, company building, branding, all of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I would every morning go for a run and put that podcast on. And I felt like every day I was learning something new. Mm -hmm. Every day there was a problem which someone else had encountered, which was relevant to what I was doing. And I would like turn up to work just fe feeling kind of inspired and encouraged mm -hmm. through this learning, which I'd absorbed um, that day. I think, yeah, like I said, reading as much as you can is really important. Reading about good leadership, but also company building and all of the problems inside your company as well. It's mm. you hire these experts inside each space, but you really want to kind of like, it's useful the more that you understand about that space because you're kind of leading the company vision direction. And so you have to do that in many ways early, in those early stage in partnership with those kind of leaders that you have inside the company. Right. So continuously upskilling is, is kind yeah. of in peril and, and just wrapping a few people around you who have done this before, who you can pick up the phone and be like, I have no idea what I'm doing right now. <laughs> it's so important to ask the questions that you don't know, you know, and I think that makes a good leader is when you're always craving information, you know, and looking to grow yourself, get better, diagnose problems. I think that makes and helps build a cult, uh, health. Uh, uh, cultivate a healthy community. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. So, okay. So we've got narrative, you're up and running, you know, people are loving your product. Uh, things are going forward. 
Um, let's talk about AI because it's a big topic right now. Uh, but things are changing and things are changing quickly. What are some of the trends that you're seeing right now within the creative world? And mm. what should we be excited about? What should we be afraid of? Uh, talk to us a bit about that whole world. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's actually been really amazing for us because we launched Select back in 2021. And the interesting thing is that when we launched that product, we put the word AI on it mm. and people were not ready for it. They were like, oh, I don't want AI. I want, you know, art. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and we actually removed the word AI from all of our marketing branding website because we were getting this like negative reaction to it and you know i've kind of explained how the product would, works it's not an automated solution and so it was really setting the wrong idea and tone now interestingly people kind of understand a little bit more about kind of the benefits of ai particularly you know 2023 it was like what was it september last year that the first version of chat gpt was released mm -hmm. was it davinci um, and people's eyes were opened a little bit in terms of the power of AI. And this has been huge for us. Like this last year, growth inside narrative and select has, you know, 16% some months, wow. which is huge. Um, and so I think it's really helpful for the audience to understand the different kinds of AI that exists, because what most people understand when they see AI is generative AI. This mm -hmm. is. ChatGPT, Midjourney, Stable Diffusion, the new Photoshop tool, which enables you to generate anything inside your photo. And generative AI is a kind of AI uses a technology called a transformer model, which when prompted, with, and this is the amazing thing about it, it use, and with natural language, it can generate an output. Um, ChatGPT is literally just a model which predicts the next word in the sentence and it does that again and again and again while taking the input of um, everything that's existed above it until that point. And um, it's really exciting. It's, it's going to change the world in many ways. Now there's a different kind of AI which has been around a little bit longer called predictive AI and predictive AI is equally powerful and as it says in the name, it predicts an output. So predictive AI is what we use inside Select. It's used in computer vision. So, um, you know, was it like 2007 when Facebook released that function which could like show the people's faces and you could name them? Right. That's, that's predictive AI. Right. Um, predictive AI is used across like the medical industry to detect cancer. It's used, you know, heaps in imagery. Um, and equally, obviously we're using it inside select as well. And the way in which it works is you feed it a whole bunch of data. Um, in most cases you have to manually label that data and you say to the model, this equals this, this equals this, this equals this. And you do that millions of times and it tries to represent that as a calculation, which is what a machine learning model is. And so in the future, when you give it a piece of data, which it's never seen before, without being trained, it can predict some kind of output. And that's kind of the key thing, which is important about AI, which is different to any other kind of technology that's existed before it is that it knows what to do with something that it's never seen before. How do you, so, so wild, how do you think AI will impact creators when it comes to social media? Do you have any inside thoughts on that? Wow, I think, yeah, so social media is gonna be interesting. Social media, you know, an element which is so important to it, I think is the connection with other humans. It's like mm -hmm. a huge part of social media is, um, the influencer and um, kind of the the organic part of that. And so I think that in some senses, the person behind social media will, needs to and always will exist. Like we wanna, we have, the, we have this desire to connect with other humans. And so I think that's, that's gonna always exist, but the method for producing that content is gonna become easier. Right. And this, kind of logic path I think applies to almost every industry you know if people are sitting around saying oh my gosh um, AI is going to take my job like I'm a content writer 
I'm a photographer, I'm a blogger, I'm a this, this and that, AI can do that, I'm not going to have a job. And the, real, the, rea the reality is that AI isn't going to take your job. It's probably somebody who's using AI who will take your job. Right. AI is going to enable people across all industries to create, to complete their, their work, their output faster with more ease, simpler. And like the perfect example of that is me, a photographer sitting behind the computer for four days after every photo shoot, that's going to change. Mm -hmm. And what's, what does that mean? It means that as a photographer, I'm going to have more time to focus on the things that fundamentally require me mm -hmm. as a photographer, which are the creative elements of my business and the aspects of the business, which grow it. So, um, there's like these, these human parts of the business, it's the building the relationships with clients, building the brand, all of that kind of stuff. And so. I now have more time to focus on making my business better, which means that I'm going to get more work. I'm going to be able to potentially charge more or maybe just shoot more and charge less. Mm -hmm. And so the photographers who don't adopt these new tools are going to kind of be left behind a little bit. Um, All right. So for photographers, photographers who are th hearing this and going, yeah, like I want to, okay, so I want to adapt. The be best way to survive anything is to adapt. So you're a landscape photographer. How do you adapt with that? Like, cause people are just generating images. How do you be like, okay, I got up early. I drove, I found a sunrise spot. I cup, captured this awesome sunrise. How do you compete when you can just generate a photo? Are you saying that people will do that? Or are you like, what's your thought there? Yeah. So landscape photography, I think is an interesting one because there's not many, uh, full-time professional landscape photographers. It's more a hobby, right? Right. Uh, what's the business model for a landscape photographer? It's either stock imagery or selling art pieces. That's right. And so uh, in some cases, I think um, like the stock imagery industry is going to completely change. It already has. There mm. are websites that exist already that exclusively have AI generated imagery. Okay. And um, I think there's a lot of, there are many uh, verticals inside the photography industry, which kind of like require high budgets and huge amounts of work. Landscape might fit that category, but the other one that's quite interesting is commercial photography. I know mm. commercial photographers that would spend like a hundred thousand dollars on a photo shoot for a campaign for Nike or mm. something like that. And what we're going to start to see change in this space is people are going to be able to output similar pieces of work with way, way, way lower budgets. And I'm not sure if you've used something like stable diffusion before. Um, it's quite similar to the new Photoshop AI tool. You can select part of an image and you can prompt it and tell it how you want to change it. You can, it understands light. It understands, you know, if the sun is here, a shadow must cast here and all of that kind of stuff. This is going to completely change this industry, but the photographer will still in some way be a necessity. You'll probably still want to work with models to, you know, maybe wear the piece of clothing that's being worn and you kind of need a visionary, some kind of, um, some kind of art director. Now there's obviously the, this other side of photography, which is more, um, focused on the, the documentary aspects of, um, imagery and included in that is things like weddings, events, family. Mm -hmm. Of and course. I think if you're in that kind of industry, you can kind of take a little bit of a sigh of relief, I think, because the reality is when someone wants something documented, generally they want it documented in the way that it existed, in the way that it happened. Right. I have had clients <laughs> fly into New Zealand from some country and be like, we wanted the sun to be um, yeah. out or something like that. And I'm like, well, it wasn't a sunny day. Um, and I, that's kind of exciting because wow, AI is going to actually enable you to make those kind of changes if that's what that person wanted. But more right. importantly, there's like, you're capturing the, uh, an event or some people, or maybe it's their relationship between them, maybe it's a family, something like that, that absolutely will always require a photographer mm -hmm. in some way. Because people want, you know, one of the things that's so important about photography is, as has existed in our history, is it enables you to remember things. It's like, it's mm -hmm. sort of an integral part of 
our experience as, as humans right. is, is to have these imageries which capture moments and that will always exist and so i think what we're going to see is that um and already like with the the release of new ai generation inside photoshop is that let's say something wasn't quite exactly as you kind of expected it to be it's really easy to fix an image now mm. um even to the point where it was like, oh, someone had their eyes closed in that photo. Well, instead of head swapping them, I can just tell it to open up their eyes. Wow. Um, stuff like that. So, yeah, it's kind of, it's exciting to see where this develops and where it goes. But the role of a photographer, particularly in documentary space, will always exist. Right. And so you're, you're saying, you know, with some categories, it's you got to adapt and get and get smarter, start using AI and other categories, still, still adapting understand AI, but you're going to be safe. So there are some people who are going to be safe. But I think, um, to your point, things evolve and change all the time. And you can't build your life in the moment. Um, and you got to look ahead to the future. It's, I think the next, you know, 20 years are going to be incredibly interesting because uh, we're going to enter this other reality, which is like the cyborg, which is, you know, as you said, in many cases has been, you know, a sci-fi concept. But and you know right now we've got Neuralink we've got many projects which are trying to work out how to enhance humans with technology what and like there's an ethical question that you need to ask yourself is like what comp what level of cyborg would I be comfortable with mm -hmm. you know would I be comfortable with an arm that can make me you know I don't know do my work faster I don't know maybe would I be comfortable with like something which plugs into my brain which gives me better memory because I could definitely do my work better. I could be, you know, a better, a more efficient human with that. Mm -hmm. And w would that become essential inside your workplace, inside succeeding in life to have that kind of technology? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe. And if that's the case, it's like, do you trust some kind of technology to live inside your brain? Yeah. Like this is a future, which <laughs> I don't know, but it's true. I don't want. <laughs> yeah. But um, we're certainly on a pathway towards uh, all of that deeper and deeper integration with technology around us. Sure. And this is why, you know, already the fear of um, AI is real because, you know, initially it was like we thought that when we imagined AI, when we created Terminator and all that sci-fi, we thought that the first versions of AI were going to be solve simple problems. We thought that they were going to be um, robots which completed automation but mm -hmm. there was actually at the other end of the scale where, where the first AI entered the mass market which was in natural language mm -hmm. and in imagery and things which we, we just didn't that's not kind of what we foresaw and that's actually in some senses more scary because we know how powerful language is mm -hmm. and it's in, indistinguishable if you're reading something which is written by AI or not and so how will that be used to manipulate people? This is already the conversations that are happening. It's, it's, yeah, we're, we're living in and already in a time where it's, um, it's a real fear that we need right. to kind of, yeah, like... when I was growing up, my grandparents were afraid of the VCR, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, like, oh, we, don't we don't understand this machine, you know, and how far we've come you know, from the VCR <laughs> and some kids are watching like, what's the VCR? Um, Google it kids. You will see, this is our life. That's how we Netflix. We had to go to the movie stores, blockbuster. Um, but the things that our grandparents were afraid of, and now I look at it and go the, the, you know, we're all in this social media app, our data is out there, our faces. When you think about our faces, you know, um, we're giving, uh, uh, what is it to face ID, you know, all everything's out there. Our whole, our voice, our, our mannerisms, who we are, our, our things we love, our social media platforms, everything's out there. So you do see that there is that kind of like fine line where things could be manipulated for the worst or they could be created for the best. And you just mm -hmm. got to trust, I mean, you know, with um, what, what hands it's in. But it does make you think sometimes just someone who grew up, you know, I feel like I've seen a lot of different things just because I, I grew up in the 80s. Um, things are moving really fast now, you know? The idea that we could connect online, that's one thing, now we're FaceTiming, we're sending money over, you know what I mean? We're cash, cashless and all this thing. Things are moving so fast now, you do see that 
it is I get why our grandparents were scared because they were probably like, whoa, this is moving too fast, you know? Um, I kind of feel like this generation is kind of like, I mean, the younger people don't care. They love it. But um, the older you get, the more skeptical you get, I think. And you start to go, oh, like, I, I'm, I'm a little bit leery here. But it will be interesting to see how AI and all of that, especially with the creator space, mm. um, takes over. So for you, um, this has been a great conversation, by the way. So thanks for joining us. What's your kind of encouragement to creators out there that are watching this that are going like you know what you've done what you've built is really cool you're solving problems mm -hmm. but what would be your um kind of you know investment or download into the creator community where they're at encouraging them today yeah absolutely i think one thing i'm continuously reminding creators is that ai isn't here to replace you it's going to make you the best version of yourself um you know our core purpose and um, vision is to replace the laborious, repetitive, painful aspects of what you need to do as a um, creative so that you can focus on the things which make you, your business, your art, you, the things that are so uniquely you. These key attributes that we have as humans, consciousness, experience, um, and those are attributes are key to the process of being creative it's you lean on your experiences it's your consciousness which drives the decisions that you make ai can only ever rip although it might appear that generative ai can create novel concepts uh, they're they're a replication of what it's seen previously you have something inside you that is not replicatable in a, in a machine and like learn how to find that and use that and yeah that drawing on that is what will kind of lead you into a place to cre mm -hmm. to create you, your art if that be your photography um or whatever industry that that you exist inside i love that a great encouragement james where can people find you they want to learn more about you they want to follow your every day they want to see what you're eating for lunch where can people find you how can they follow you uh, if you want to learn about narrative jump over to narrative or you can find us on instagram at narrative app uh if you want to follow me personally instagram's probably the best place james yeah and i'd love to hear from you guys let me know what you think about this and if you're a photographer i highly encourage you to give narrative a go if you've been thinking oh my gosh, I don't want AI to do my job for me, then Narrative Select is probably the tool that you've been looking for. Nice. This has been so great. We'll make sure we link all that. James, you have been so great. And every time we need to know the future, we're going to get you on the call and you can just let us know what's happening <laughs> <laughs> uh, down the road. But listen, thank you so much for joining us. A great conversation, delightful. And we always want to encourage people, um, you know, James is a uh, great creator but he's also a problem solver and an entrepreneur founder and uh, if you are out there creating and you're starting a business there's a lot of great advice obviously today that I think James brought to us and we're gonna check out that podcast 20 EBC I think that sounds really really great so check it out. thanks thanks for joining us today this has been an awesome conversation really appreciate you taking the time getting up early uh, there in New Zealand and I uh, appreciate it hey guys if you like the Socality show you like what you're listening to you want more information like this make sure to like and subscribe and you can listen to this podcast wherever you consume your favorite podcast thanks for joining we'll see you soon